Welcome to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today, we're chatting about the benefits of slow burn bar prep. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the bar exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about the advantages of doing a more slow burn style of bar prep. Well, most typically, students graduate from law school and prepare for the bar in a very focused way over eight to 10 weeks. This is a super intense style of preparation and frankly, doesn't really work for everyone. Lee, what are some of the downsides here? Well, I think the biggest downside is just it's a lot of stress and anxiety. It's a really <laughs> it <is. laughs> challenging period of time. I think there are only going to be a handful of people that you talk to ever who are like, I enjoyed bar prep. Most of I, us. I've literally never heard anyone say that. Yeah. Most of us did not enjoy it <laughs> at all. No. Um, it's also hard because you have a ton of material to learn and also very little time to do it. Usually only two to three days per topic. And this includes topics you didn't take in law school. So think about it an entire semester of material in two to three days if you're lucky. That's a lot. Yeah, definitely. I mean, particularly, I mean, some of these classes, you think about something like, you know, evidence. It's like, how in the world could you possibly learn that? I mean, but I definitely remember sitting down with my schedule and being like, all right, community property. I have two days to get up to speed on this topic. Hmm, wills and trusts, same thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's just not a lot of... uh not a lot of time. And so I think, you know, people try to study so many hours per day. And a lot of these schedules have so many hours a day of study time they're expected. But you really honestly can't focus and learn for more than, you know, for most people, probably I would say four ish hours a day, whether you have that really focused time. And so if your study schedule has you doing 12 hour days, you just have to be realistic that you're not actually going to be like internalizing very much for some of that time. I think that's true. And when you think about the focus during the day, you know, that's why we advocate that the balance between kind of review and memorization and practice is so critical because just straight up memorization, like reading an outline, internalizing information. Yeah, there are only so many hours a day your brain can do that for most of us. You might be able to do more active learning tasks outside of that core, maybe four hours where you're the most productive. But some of these study schedules are absolutely insane of what they think that you can accomplish during a day. And you can accomplish it, but you're going to be a mess and you're not going to be performing very well, which is also going to lead to more stress, which is going to make it harder to study. (laughs) I mean, it's like such a vicious (laughs) cycle. It is a vicious cycle because you get burned out, which is super common. And people start having problems sleeping because they're so stressed out and because they're trying to put all this information into their brain like all day long with no breaks. And then things like memorization often start way too late in this process. So suddenly, you know, you're weeks from the exam and you're supposed to start memorizing all this stuff and then you focus only on the memorization and then practice kind of falls by the wayside. And so all of these things just kind of build on themselves and compound until people show up to the test and they're just like this ball of like broken down stress, anxiety, like, oh my God, I don't even know my name. And I think mm-hmm. that's why a lot of people struggle. Yeah, I think that that's true. And if you are someone who's getting extra time for the exam due to maybe a learning difference or there are a variety of reasons why individuals may qualify for extra time, it's interesting, but the bar prep companies don't really talk about that if you get extra time to level the playing field in an exam situation, that you probably need extra time to study competitively in the same situation. So that's not a criticism of anyone who needs that extra time. That's just being practical. Your practice is going to take longer because you're doing it under different timed conditions. And your study schedule probably doesn't account for that. And so you're doing a much larger amount of work in the same amount of time than the person who's taking the exam in standard time next to you. And that is a huge challenge. 
Right. I mean, it just stands to reason if you're getting 1.5 time to take the test, you're probably going to need 1.5 time to study for the test. <laughs> yeah. And you, you're going to have to practice 1.5 time on all of your practice questions. That's right. just going to take longer. <laughs> right. And I think, you know, the reason you're getting extra time is because things take longer for you to do like reading and processing and that kind of stuff. So yeah, you just have to be kind of cognizant of that and not think like, oh, I'll just sign up for this eight week crash course like everybody else and then I'll be fine. It's like the schedule's already insane. Like it's going to be doubly insane for you. Yeah. So now that we've talked about all the downsides, what do you think are some of the alternatives if if people are concerned about this eight to 10 week crunch? Well, I think you have to look at which category you're in. You know, are you a first time taker? Or are you someone who's retaking the exam? And one of the things that I think is often overlooked for first time takers is that you can actually start doing a lot of bar prep in law school and kind of spread this out. So mm-hmm. It might be, you know, that your school's offering something that you can take to kind of get you up to speed on certain things. But almost in a way, I mean, some of this is when we talk about what classes to take. If you take a lot of bar classes, you're actually spreading out essentially your prep. So that is actually a pretty good strategy for a slow burn approach is to take more bar classes. I mean, particularly Mm -hmm. people should take evidence. But, um, you know, some of these classes that you might be debating between, it's like, well, if you spend a semester on it versus two days, that's going to be a lot less pressure because you already know a lot of that material. Yes. I think a lot of um, students sometimes take some of those bar prep classes, but don't really try very hard because right. they are three L's. I mean, I taught some of these classes. and <laughs> You're talking about the ones that kind of specifically focused on the bar. Yeah. They might be, um, you know, on one piece of the exam or they might be a true class that's like almost like a mini bar prep that you can get credit for. One, you should take that class if it's offered at your school. But second, you should try. Right. <laughs> I would have students not paying attention. I'm like, I get it. You're a 3L. But you have this really big test coming soon, and I am helping you prep for it right now. <laughs> Just stay with me. It was only like a two-hour class. And so that is study time. If you pay attention, it counts as study time, and you're just knocking it out early. It all compounds on each other. It's like deposits in the bank. Every time you do something to prepare for the exam, even if it's early on, it's like a deposit in the bank account of studying. And all of that will add up, even if it's just a few hours a week. Right. And, you know, for example, like a lot of schools do classes on the performance test. And of Mm -hmm. course, I'm sure a lot of students blow that off and like, oh, this is so ridiculous. Like, I can't believe I'm having to deal with this while I'm in school. Like, I'll just deal with it in bar prep. It's like, why don't you just get up to speed on that part of the test beforehand and not worry about it when you're trying to memorize a bunch of other stuff? Yeah, it's great to basically be able to knock that part of the exam out and not really have to worry about it when you're studying 13 or, or however many subjects you want to count because there are all these different ways you can count the subjects. But, right. you know, depending on your bar, it it really is nice to say like, wow, I already feel like I can ace the performance test and now I don't have to worry about that while I'm trying to balance studying for all those other complicated issues. Right. So when you see like a bunch of stuff come up on your schedule, you're like, oh, I can either like take that time off or I can use that time for something else. Mm-hmm. Win. Win. But you only get that if you actually like do the work and put in the effort and make a serious, appro- you know, serious like attempt to do this when it's coming early, which I think for whatever reason, people seem to get really annoyed about. Yeah. Now, what about people who are retaking the exam or are working and studying? Yes. Is starting early going to be a good idea for them? Oh, yes. I think it might be. I mean, you know, the problem with having to retake the exam is oftentimes people do have a job and, you know, they'd expect it to have passed and they didn't pass. So now bar study has to fit into the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, oftentimes there's not all that much time left over already. So I think you've got to do quite a bit longer time frame here. Um, and this is just, you know, a practical numbers game, if nothing else. But I think even if people can take time off, Um, you know, say you find out four to five months ahead of the next exam that you failed and you have a job and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to take off like a month or two. So I'll just wait to study then. I don't think that's a great plan. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think it is. Um, Also, because a lot of stuff can happen, (laughs) you know, and I think that typically people who are working and studying or people who are retaking it, 
we talk to a lot of people who are also juggling family responsibilities. They may have, um, you know, maybe they're taking care of elder parents. Maybe they're taking care of small children. Maybe they're getting married. They have like a lot of stuff happening in life. And if you say, oh, it'll be fine because, you know, I can just count on studying later and then life gets in the way. Yeah. <laughs> like, and and I like a good insurance policy. I feel like, again, going back to this depositing in the bank, if you are constantly um, investing in this goal, then if something derails you, then you're not going to be sunk. And I don't want anyone to feel like, you know, one turn of events is going to sink their whole bar prep because a lot of things can rely on passing the bar. Yeah, I remember when I was taking California as my second bar, I was working at a firm and they gave me three weeks off. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I can probably manage in that time. What I did not plan on happening was that I was literally so sick the first week of the three weeks that I could not get out of bed. So, you know, I lost basically a third of the dedicated study time that I'd planned on having. So that was extremely stressful because you just don't know what's going to happen in that time frame. So I think spreading it out, you know, giving yourself, even if you're studying like 10 hours a week, a few weeks, a few months out, and then you're gradually ramping it up. I think it's just, it's almost like, you know, training for some sort of physical event. Like you're going to get more efficient and more, you know, better as you go along, but you've got to start. Yeah. I think that that's very true. Now, um, what are some practical tips for people who do want to study kind of further out and on this longer time period? Well, one of the things I think we end up talking with people a lot, and I know you've talked to a lot of people, is like really when in the day are you going to fit this in? Yeah. I talk to a lot of people who tell me a lot of really lofty goals about when they're going to study. I know. (laughs) I hear hear all of it. I hear I get up at 4.30 and then I work out until 5.30 and then I shower and I'm studying for the bar by 6 and then at 7 I'm feeding my kids and I'm like, that is sounds like really committed. Is that practical? Like, can you keep up with that schedule? I'm sure there are people who can, but a lot of us cannot. And so um, like that's, that's a burnout danger. So it's really important when you think about finding these hours to study is can you find them where you're actually functioning? I don't know. My daughter got up at 530 this morning. I don't know how people do anything at 530. Like, <laughs> I was like, just it's a good thing that I can just push buttons on my coffee maker. Like that's about all I have the capacity to do at 5.30. So 5.30 is not a magical study time for me. I wouldn't be able to get anything done. <laughs> no, not retaining def- information at 5.30. That's just not no, how it's going to happen. I'm definitely not the morning person. If I have to get up before like, you know, nine or something, I'm just like, ah, I mean, I had to get up for something like 6.30 last week and I was literally a mess for the entire day. I was not functioning. Yeah. Um, so I think that, I think, you know, depending, maybe someone could do it super early. The other time that, you know, I think is tempting and also potentially problematic is people are like, well, I'm going to work a full day and then I'm going to start studying and I'm going to do, you know, six to 11 every night. And, you know, that may be the time that you need to study, but I don't think studying six to 11 every single night after work is particularly realistic. No, I don't think it is either. And you're really like, if you're going to do that for a three to four months, which is how long people study part-time sometimes. That is a long time to keep those hours. It's just a yeah. really long time. Yeah, I just think you have to be realistic about burnout and also focus. And so I would rather have somebody study, you know, three days a week consistently and take those other two days off and actually like, you know, revitalize themselves and like be a human being than try to study five days a week. Because mm-hmm. I just don't think, you know, particularly if you're doing weekends, like, you know, when are you taking a break? Like, when is your brain relaxing? So, you know, maybe you can schedule it so that your work days are a little bit lighter three days a week, and then you study on top of that, and then you pack more meetings into those other two days. But just by being realistic about, you know, your ability to focus on material, I think you can, you know, probably study fewer hours, but get more done. I think that's true. Another schedule I've seen for working and studying folks is Sometimes you can work with your job to do 40 hours a week in four days Mm -hmm. and then have one day a week that you just focus on bar prep. I've seen that for longer study periods um, also be helpful because you get your best brain to do your studying instead of those late night hours or the squeezed in hours at lunch, um, which typically aren't very effective. So it depends on the job. Some some jobs, it's not a practical 
um, solution, but you never know. You have to kind of, that's another benefit of thinking about this early is you can kind of go to your job and see what they can do. I've actually heard of a lot of jobs being really flexible and helpful. You just mm-hmm. have to give them warnings so everybody can plan around it. Yeah, and I think having that three-day weekend can be really helpful because that can give you a lot of focus time and also some time to take time off. Sometimes people's jobs will even you know, let them study in the morning and come to work in the afternoon or vice mm-hmm. versa. So you know, I think there are, you know, people tend, I mean, not all jobs, but I think most bosses and jobs tend to understand that like, okay, this is important and we're going to have to figure out a way to work around this if you're actually going to be able to pass. So just kind of thinking about when are you most likely to be fresh and like, how is this going to work? I think is great. Um, I think you also want to, when you're scheduling this, you want to build in quite a lot of time to do catch up. And so, Mm. you know, we do this in our schedules. We give people time in the week where it's like a pretty large block, like, you know, three, four hour type of thing to do catch up work. And it's like, if you're caught up, then great, take time off or like do something else. But if you don't build in that time to catch up, I think studying over the longer time frame can just make you feel like you're constantly falling behind. Yeah, which isn't a good mental place to be. If you no. you just feel like a failure every day that you try and do this, it's just it's yeah, not it's going not to gonna, good. It's not, it's not going to not gonna end well. No. For first-time takers, if you're trying to you know, pull out some time to do some studying during the semester – you know, this is a great opportunity to look at your schedule and say, okay, I don't have class on Fridays. Maybe Friday morning is my bar prep time. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you just kind of block it out just like you would block out any other like block of deep work. I think that's especially effective if you're going to work on, let's say the performance test or the performance test takes 90 minutes to take. And then maybe you would need 90 minutes to review it and to kind of study it. Right. Um, So it's like a three, let's just, you know, let's say it's like a three hour block to, you know, to really kind of work the question. Like a three hour block on a day you don't have class should be like doable to find. You know, that's not like a 10 hour block. It's like a three hour block. (laughs) I mean, you can basically you can wake up, have breakfast, like sit down, do the performance test and then review it. And then by lunchtime, you're ready to go and do other things. Exactly. And I think that one of the mistakes people make is they're like, well, what could I do in three hours? And you can actually do quite a bit in three hours um, to start to chip away at this problem. Definitely. Three hours is like, I mean, that's a good chunk of time. You can get a lot done on a lot of different things. And I think when you're thinking about planning your schedule, you can also be helpful to think about rotating through topics and rotating through activities and things like that. So you're not constantly like doing the same thing, which is probably going to get really boring. Yeah. Because if you have, if you are studying over a longer time frame, you can use the techniques of spaced repetition and things like that, where maybe you do, you know, a day or two on a certain topic and you do some practice and you review it and then you switch and then you come back to it a few weeks later. That's actually going to help all the stuff stay in your brain better. Yeah, exactly. So you need... Kind of this time, you know, we have to touch things multiple times for it to move into our longer term memory. And because of the amount of material that the bar tests, you can't all have it in your short term memory. It doesn't work. No. I don't think most people's short term memories have enough for, like space. The file cabinets are full. <laughs> like, you right. And, you know, as you're studying, particularly if it's a longer time frame, you want to think about how am I going to capture some of this information for myself so that I can go back and review it quickly later. So True you know, you want to have some sort of condensed outline or study aid or something that when you look at, you know, you sit down in the morning, it's like, all right, today we're doing contracts. It's like, oh, what do I know about contracts? You look at this couple of pages and you're like, oh, right. Now I know a lot about contracts. Mm -hmm. I can start to like do something with that material. Yeah. One of the tricks I used to do when I would um, do studying in kind of that space repetition way where I would leave something for a while and come back to it. At the end of my study day, I would make a to-do list of the things that I wanted to pick up the, as soon as I sat down the next time. So mm-hmm. maybe it was, you know, go back over these few concepts that you're struggling with or review this and redo this practice question. It can really make it much more efficient when you sit down to see w- where you want to be, kind of get things started versus sitting down and being like, contracts. Hmm. Right. Yeah. What was I <laughs> reviewing? You know, it just is a nice way to kind of give yourself um, a bit of a kick to get started if you've already developed your plan the last time that you reviewed that material. 
Yeah. And you could even go ahead and like pick out the next question you're going to work on, or at least like mm-hmm. the next topic you want to work on. And then, you know, use something like the Brainy Bar Bank to be like, all oh, right, I wanted to do a question on, you know, whatever. Um, parole evidence. Huh, everyone's favorite. Um, you know, so that you're, you're not you've got the you're not using that executive brain power of like oh what was i going to work on it's just like oh right i need to pull a parole evidence question and get started on that boom done yeah. mm-hmm. exactly and i had a boss who was incredibly good at doing things like this when i was in my early 20s she was in, well she is i'm sure she's still <laughs> she's still actually doing the same work we did back in the day together but um she would never leave for the day without all of her stuff organized on her desk and a very clear to-do list for the next day it was like just her jam and i really started to see how like starting your day without playing catch up is a very efficient way to move things along so it is some a lesson that i've tried to take with me to other things and i think studying is one of those things where you can remind yourself exactly where you stopped or what you need to do next um, I'm even doing that with, I'm making these, I make these like photo albums of my family every year. Um, and it's a long project. It takes a long time to be compile all the stuff. I was working on it yesterday and I have a note at the top. That's like, when you pick this up, like, this is the date that I stopped. This is the next thing you need to do <laughs> because sometimes it'll be a week or so till I come back and I'm like, what was I looking at? What was I pulling photos of? I mean, you just can't remember that stuff. You have to write it down. Yeah, definitely. I think finding some way to track where you are and like how things are going and what you need to be working on, whether, you know, whatever works for you, whether it's a piece of paper or notes or a Trello board, you know, you can think of a lot of different approaches, but you want something to kind of try to cut down on that executive overhead, particularly because you are doing this over a longer time frame and you may be doing it along with other things. There is going to be more of the stop and start and you want to make sure that you know, you're using your time efficiently, which means not like sitting there spinning your wheels for 20 minutes every day being like, wait, what was I supposed to be doing? I don't Mm -hmm. know. Like you want a clear schedule and, you know, it can be malleable, but you want to kind of have that in place and think of ways to make it easy to pick up where you left off. Yeah. And I think set up kind of reflection points for yourself, you know, every week, maybe probably every week, maybe every two weeks, take a bit of time to say like, How's it going? Right. You know, Where am I am getting I? anything out of what I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, did I not reach my goals this week? Did, you know, like what, you know, you want to kind of have these moments of reflections. Sometimes you have to recommit. It can be very hard to have these kind of abstract projects that go on for a very long time. So checking in with yourself, evaluating how it's going, being honest with yourself, and then pivoting as necessary will help you from wasting a lot of time down the road. Yeah, and definitely, you know, if you have missed time that you'd scheduled, you know, you've got to kind of triage on that. Okay, what mm-hmm. what might be able to be like dropped? What might I be able to do more efficiently? Because I think there can be like a mental game, obviously, here too. Of like you need to not get in that category of like, oh, I fell behind. So it's kind of like when you fall off your diet, you know, you're suddenly like, oh my gosh, I had one like hamburger. So now I'm going to have like 14 hamburgers mm-hmm. plus a bunch of ice cream. Right. Um, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, you know, for whatever reason, something happened this week and I didn't do everything I wanted to do, but let's figure out how to get back on track. Um, I think that sort of, you know, meta level focus is something you're going to have to do throughout the process. Another thing that I've been thinking about um, recently is making sure that you're developing the stamina to do the sort of studying as well. I think that in the beginning, studying some of this material can be really exhausting <laughs> like oh, whether sure. or not you're still in law school or outside of law school but the more you do it um there'll be a point where you just have a much higher tolerance for it because you've got stamina you're not getting as fatigued um i just started playing tennis again and it's taken like five six weeks for it not to like hurt the next day <laughs> like, you know, it just, i was kind of like am i just too old to pick up new things because it really hurts like, but it just you don't realize that you sometimes need quite a long time to kind of build up the stamina to do hard things. Oh, yeah. And I think we don't really talk about that with bar prep. You know, in the beginning, um, it's going to seem much harder to sit down and focus for long periods of time. But if you think about how the exam is laid out, you have to be able to start focusing in like, you know, three hour blocks or longer if you get extended time. And the easiest way to get better at that is to practice it. So even in the slow burn prep, you can kind of do kind of a slower increase on how long you study and with what focus, but you do need to give yourself 
enough time to build up that stamina, it's going to be easier as you get closer to the test. Definitely. Well, before we wrap up, let's talk about what are some things that you can do that are good things to do early? Like we've already talked about the performance test. You know, there's nothing to memorize for that. The more of them you see of different types, probably the less likely you are to get freaked out if there's something weird that shows up. So I think that's always a great option for starting early. And I want to add to that, though, that I think this is one place that our writing of the week program can be very helpful Mm -hmm. for folks who want to start studying for the performance test but aren't sure where to start because we we walk you through videos that kind of talk about all the different types of performance tests that you're going to see and help you do some facilitated practice it can be a nice way to start if you're just not sure where to start true yeah it's probably more effective than just picking mm -hmm. up a test and doing it yeah. So that's just, if you're saying, well, that's great, Lee and Allison, I don't know where to start. That's somewhere you can look at. We can link to that in the show notes. Yeah. Very simple. Very good idea. The other place I think starting early is never going to hurt you is with the MBE because oh, so sorry. much of that is just seeing the questions and the repetition of the questions that really just the earlier you start and the more you do, probably the better off you're going to be. And I think people have a sometimes unrealistic idea of how you know, People who failed might come and be like, I did so many MBE questions. I did a thousand questions. It's like, that's not enough. Right. I know. <laughs> that's so true. I mean, it sounds like, like a lot. And we don't want to discredit that that's a lot of questions. But that's but, like half what you need to be doing, uh, basically, based on like yeah. the data. Yeah. You got to, it takes a lot of time to do all of that. Most people don't also recognize that a lot of the MBE providers that do MBE only prep, um, give you access to their materials pretty much as soon as the bar ends. So mm -hmm. let's say you're going to sit for the July exam that they usually turn on your access March 1st, around March 1st. Right. But most people don't, one, don't know that, or two, <laughs> don't, don't sign up that early. Um, but that means you have all of March, all of April, and a chunk of May before you get going on your um, your full bar prep. I mean, that's three months. If you did, like, I mean, you don't even have to do that many questions each week to right. have that be a huge deposit in that study bank account. I and mean, if you did even 10 questions a day, which is not that big of a deal. No. I mean, that would be a lot of questions that you had done. You might have already done a thousand by that point. Yeah. 50 questions a week. I mean, like really, there are a lot of options. Yeah. So I think that's a great place to start. Um, before we wrap up, I mean, do you see any pitfalls to this slow burn approach? Well, you know, you certainly need a degree of intensity to get things done and be able to manage your own workload <laughs> because this does take an awful lot of focus. So that is something that you want to kind of keep on top of. You've got to you've got to be a self starter and you have to manage this process. Right. And I think sometimes it, people think like, oh, you know, I'll start early. I'll do like one hour of MBE questions like at lunch when I'm working for a while. And like that's not nothing. But at the same time, I think you need like some bigger chunks to actually get stuff done. So if you're only doing like five hours a week over like a year, mm -hmm. I think that's probably less effective than doing maybe 10 hours a week, even over six months or something like that. Yeah, I think that that's true. I think there's a limit basically like beyond which doing it more is probably not going to help. Yeah. I mean, how long do you want the bar to kind of be a huge part of your life? <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, really sometimes hard. people are like, oh, I'm planning for two years out. And it's like, really? I don't know. That seems like a very long time to study for one exam. It does. It does. Yeah. So you definitely want to be conscious of like what you're biting off and make sure that it's not going to lead to its own type of burnout. <laughs> you don't want the slow yeah. burn to lead to burnout. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, okay. And you know, there may be exceptions, like someone who's like foreign trained lawyers, never seen any of this stuff before. Okay, that's going to take more time. But for somebody who went to, you know, has a JD, like if they're going to study for two years for some reason, I just feel like that's probably dragging this out longer yeah. than it needs to happen. I think so too. I also think that it's easy to put things off later because you have so much time. Oh, right. Um, yeah. So... That's just always a huge danger. You know, you're saying like, I don't need to do it today because I could do it tomorrow. I can do it next week. I have 12 weeks. There's so much right. time. But to make this plan really work for you, you have to be doing those deposits. And if you just aren't doing them, that's going to be a huge problem. Yeah, I think it's the consistency that we're looking for here. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, every day that you blow off doing anything is just one day that you're not getting any closer to this goal. Yeah, I 100% agree. 
Well, we're wrapping up our time together. What are your final thoughts on this topic, Allison? Well, I think you just want to be thoughtful about what's probably going to work best for you and also your time availability um, and realize that there are advantages of doing this kind of more as a marathon than a sprint. And even if it's, you know, kind of the less standard way to go about it, I think there are a lot of arguments in favor. Yeah, I really think that it's a lost opportunity to to not do a little bit of prep. I mean, there's going to be classes you didn't take. There, I mean, there's just so many options for things that you can do to just lighten your load over the summer um, or over the winter whenever you're doing this prep. And I think that um, starting early, it's almost like an insurance policy too. Like if something complicated happens in your life, I mean, we've had students have all sorts of crazy stuff happen, right? I've oh, had, yeah. I've had appendicitis, car accidents, and moving, and this and that, and family emergencies. I mean, we can't even come up. I mean, the list is so long that the more you do early, the less likely you are to be derailed by something, you know, kind of wild that could happen in your life too. Hey, no, no. In addition to being sick in bed, the house next to me also burned down and almost burned down my house. So yes, like, you know, these were unpredictable things, but I probably could have started studying earlier. Yeah. But you know, one other thing we should mention is that people talk a lot about, or people as in like people who chat about the bar exam, which is us basically. <laughs> a very small set of the world. Very, very small <laughs> set of and our team. But, you know, we talk about the bars from 2020 when they delayed the bar exam mm-hmm. and that pass rates really went up, especially at a lot of schools who had struggled with their pass rates in the past. And, um, and then pass rates went back down <laughs> after that. And I think for a lot of people that, they ended up being forced into a slow burn approach because Mm -hmm. they kept changing the dates of the exam, which was torturous in its own way. So I'm definitely not advocating that the bar do that again. It was unprecedented times. But um, taking an October exam instead of a July exam made a huge difference for a lot of people. And so I think that's an important lesson that um, people should consider, that it was much easier for many people to take the bar because they studied for a longer period of time. So maybe you should try it too. Yeah. And the other thing on that is if you're studying for a longer period of time and things aren't going well, you actually have more time to get help because we had people coming to us like in September and yeah. things like that, where they're like, I don't think this is going well. And we're like, great, you still have some time. Like we can help you with that. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, I think we're out of time. I want to take a second to remind you to check out our blog at baregamtoolbox.com, which is full of helpful tips to help you prepare and stay sane as you study for the bar exam. You can also find information on our website about our courses, tools, and one-on-one tutoring programs to help you study for the UBE or California bar exam. And hey, those are customized. You can start them anytime. You can do early bar prep with us. Happens all the time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you are still in law school, you might also like to check out our popular Law School Toolbox podcast as well. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at baregamtoolbox.com or allison at baregamtoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at baregamtoolbox.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon.